Ooh. Hello, Craig. Hello there, and welcome to Roll on the Adventure, the show in which we create role-playing games, play them, and then rip them apart for the gory display for the audience or something like that. Uh, hi there, I'm Dave, and I'm going to be uh, leading this session, which we're going to be creating our third game. Roll on the intro. Roll, 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 roll. Uh, adventure. Roll on the adventure. 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 Go. Got it. <laughs> that was acceptable. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, we different people. We're going to have to uh, like work on it over the next one. It's going to be great. When I was listening to a previous episode, just to kind of get a vibe of what you guys are about, it's like, do I teach them how to do a four-part harmony? Is that a thing worth doing? Just to kind of, and actually, no, the chaos is possibly better. You can try <laughs> to teach this. The results are going to be uncertain, though. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, would everyone like to introduce themselves? Um, and it's going to be introducing yourself again for Demetrius. Hello, I'm Demetrius. I've been playing role-playing games for more than two decades now, so that's who I am. I've been uh, with these guys for the past two arcs. This is our third. I'm so excited. Um, I've written uh, Frontier that you may not have heard of, and I'm playing in London in the RB Haven. That's enough for me, I think. Chris? So I've been gaming for just under 20 years, I think. Uh, not written anything because I'm not awesome, unfortunately. Uh, but I do run or play games every week at Refugees from Reality in Chesterfield. So if anyone wants to come along, feel free to. We do lots of many different games. And yeah, I can't think of much more else to say. Hi there, I'm Dave. I run a lot of things at anime conventions and... Uh... Not a huge amount else right now at the moment. Uh, trying to organize players is a bit of a difficult thing, really. Um, I write a lot of games, little ones mostly, it's like single pages. I kind of like lightweight sort of storytelling-y type things. And joining us this, uh, this time is Nathan. Hello, everybody. I am your new favorite parasocial crush, Nathan Blades. I uh, also appear on Bunkazilla Radio, hosting The Passion Project radio show. It's an LGBT artist. Review show. Um, I have been doing tabletop RPGs for about a decade, ever since sixth form. And uh, these days, I also run my own actual play podcast called The Talent Agency, which you can find on Podbean and iTunes. Cool. So, the last game that we made uh, was called Primordia. Uh, does anyone want to give us a brief rundown of what happened there? So, it was a game where you, more, a very much a broad story game rather than one focusing on specific characters where you work. Firstly, you sit down with the other players to define the broad themes of the world and assign those to various playing cards. And then you basically draw those playing cards in theory to try and win points by beating whatever the, you define the enemy as being. But we ended up using it more as points, pointers and prompts to make up a story and see what happened, really. So it was quite good for building a broad world and the various cultures within it. It was kind of fun. Neat. Yeah, we had uh, floating rocks. We had um, a grand betrayal. Uh, we had a lot of uh, strange magics, uh, mysterious shaman, that kind of thing. It was mm -hmm. a really mm -hmm. fun game. A lot of people narrating themselves to death. There was a lot of people narrating themselves to death. Um, so this time we're going to do something a little bit different. Thing. At the end of the last game, we kind of came up with some prompts to start with. And uh, the first one of those was spying. Uh, Demetrius, you, you're the one who brought that up. Anything particular with spying that you wanted to explore? Um, I think that um, it's, a, it's a way for me to cope with the, the TV show The Americans uh, being... Uh, completed and I, I think that spy games have been seriously underrepresented in um, most um, system specific role playing games. I think that we have tons of fantasy, we have tons of sci fi, but spy games you can only hope uh, via generic systems or 
mm. uh, things like that. Feng Shui is probably an exception to that, but I, I'm, I'm really thinking, um, you know, that we could, could offer something uh, much more robust in that area. Cool. Um, and the focus there was on mission-based gameplay, which I think is uh, pretty appropriate. So you'll be tasked with something. Mm -hmm. And uh, strange juxtapositions, I believe, were also brought up. Can't remember who said that to us. Hmm. There's a strong chance that Joel was the one to bring it up, no? It is entirely possible. Yeah. It's a good thing you have me on this episode, then, for these particular things, because... Um... Uh, my the what I normally work in is uh, Shadowrun Anarchy, which most um, cyberpunk shenanigans are very specifically mission based. They are they are very directive heavy. Um, nice. So it is a format of uh, GM writing I am quite used to. Um, also, I very recently wrote a a one shot that I am still experimenting with, so I haven't widely published it yet, but. Um, it's called um, Blood Orange, open brackets. It's F in red, close brackets, a game about fabulous gay spies. Uh, so I <laughs> already have um, spies and missions kind of within my tabletop RPG headspace at the moment. Ah, oh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, one thing that was brought up was splitting the group um, segments with one or two primary people in them. This was almost entirely me, uh, because it makes editing the podcast easier. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the big one in this category is three GMs, one player. Okay. <laughs> Long, slightly awkward silence. Yeah. Uh, this <laughs> is followed up by split responsibilities and changing roles. So mm. we could have different people in charge of different things. Uh, we could have like a rotating single focus character, things like that. That could be quite mm -hmm. interesting. Oh, yeah. Cool. And the other thing that we brought up was technology, because if you're doing a modern uh, a modern day game, then you can uh, quite easily incorporate real world technology. And mm. we thought it'd be nice if the technology in the game mirrored the technology out of the game. OK. We thought that'd be quite nice for the play experience, you know. But is it nice for radio? There's only one way to find out, which mm. is to play it. I mean, you could think about it, but that's less conclusive. I, yeah, no, let's not think about the that we put. Tinkering and hacking is uh, pretty much what we do. Like, if it if it's not successful, we know, you know, we know now that it's not successful. That's. Oh no, I understand that. I'm just saying it's design concern as part of the process. <laughs> oh yes, yes, <laughs> very definitely. So, does anyone want to take a category and? I discuss that. Shall shall I take some mission based gameplay? Yeah, go for it. Uh, what yeah. does that mean to you? What sort of things do you tend to do with that? So, um, sometimes talking about things is also talking about what it's not. And part of yeah. what I find uh, as part of the kind of like tabletop IPG zeitgeist at the moment is the idea of sandbox gameplay. But you know, yeah. Uh, you have you spend a lot of time creating a world, but not necessarily a thing to do, and then you let your players decide on what they want to do, and that can definitely work. I personally get horrible decision paralysis, dislike uh, that form of play, which is why mission-based gameplay works really well for me. It's about um, knowing that by the end of whatever play session you're doing, active progress has been made, and it makes yeah. it a little easier to craft. Um, the session as a piece of um, film. I, 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 yeah. I like to think about, um, especially since, you know, a lot of the tabletop RPG I st stuff I do is for broadcast, um, thinking of tabletop RPGs as its own weird bastardization version of film and thinking about the kind of like pacing and hitting narrative arcs within a fixed period of time. And mission-based gameplay is so, so good for that. Um, also, you don't actually have to do a lot of writing for mission-based gameplay. Um, as, as a GM, you can um, go incredibly light in terms of notes. It can just be a mission objective, uh, some keywords, and just the kind of like personalities and names of some important people, and you yeah. can just work with that. Or maybe it's just the floor, gram floor plan of a cruise ship, and then all the yeah. rest you just work on the fly. Uh, it, 
it's um, very open to being improv more so than some other gem and storytelling styles. Yeah. Chris, you've done a few mission-based things that I've seen. Yeah, they tend to be really good for convention games because you can just go, some guys told you to do this. You feel you should go and do this. And then, Mm -hmm. as Nathan says, here's a plan. You think there's some guards here. You think there's possibly an entrance point here. You have some skills and stuff. Go. It tends to be really good for an immediate obvious hook because you've got an immediate obvious target to go and get. Yeah. And that's one of the really nice things about it. Um, you know, you've got that structure. I think having the like motivations baked in is kind of really important for it as well. Mm-hmm. It um, feasibly cuts down on both player and GM faffing. Yeah, I, I don't know if you've ever had a circumstance where you've been given a nebulous goal and you'll spend the next half an hour to 45 minutes or longer just discussing on what you should be doing to tackle it. Yeah. Or when you don't even have that and the GM's kind of assuming you're at some point going to get to the starting point of the quest mm-hmm. and you don't no, know where that is or have a reason to go there. So you're just kind of wandering around the starting town effectively. Like it's a computer game without any quest. Mm-hmm. Absolutely yeah, that's not. N- that's not fun. <laughs> so I'm thinking of like briefings. They're kind of an important thing in these uh, fictions. Heck yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that's going to be quite interesting. Demetrius? Uh, I'm thinking also debriefings are a great thing about missions. Um, I, I've, in, in a few uh, video games I've played, like um, Splinter Cell or, you know, spy sort of things, uh, there's the, the debrief. And I, I, I think that's actually a very nice way to make the players. Um, do as much progress as they can because they know there's a debrief. Um, uh, you know, actual military work also works like this. So you're expected to have certain results and you, you're you expected to have to explain your choices in some way or another. Might You might be quite loose with, with what you're trying to do, but you still have to... Um, to to uh, compare your choices to a certain plan, which is um, always uh, pushing the the movement forward. I think that's one thing. I've also had some very good um, results from using the like debrief as a framing device. Mm-hmm. So um, mm-hmm. there have been ones where I've started off in the debrief. Uh, one guy has a broken leg. One guy has a uh, briefcase uh, handcuffed to their arm that kind of thing, and Mm -hmm. they've got to explain how they got into that situation. This is me. I think you might be wondering how I got into this situation. (laughs) (laughs) Flashbacks. Alternatively, the opening to Atomic Blonde, which is uh, definitely uses that as a narrative device for its spy movie shenanigans. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Plus, you, you, can, you can inject more than uh, plans and open spaces like, um, you know, um, yachts and um, hidden bases and things like that. You can still have this sort of emotional, um, emotion-infused scenes like um, no man left behind. You go back to, to bring your uh, comrade that's been... Um, you know, um, surrounded by enemies, for example, or things like that. You can still um, have some emotional impact and uh, becomes less sandboxing. People are more invested um, in a different way, I think. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I've never really seen it as like an investment driver, but that's a really interesting take on it. Yeah, this is this is a struggle I have with uh, Frontier uh, a lot of the times because it's a military game and a lot of people, um, you know, uh, just uh, distill uh, uh, war to mass combat and things like this. But sometimes, you know, there there are stories like uh, I don't know, you have to convince a planet to join the effort, for example. You have to do certain things that are more um, uh, character-driven and drama-driven instead of uh, tactics or strategy in the the, the, Mm. the more strict sense. So I'm Mm -hmm. thinking it's primarily going to be like information gathering, or are we looking at sort of 
the assassination of wet worky thing, defections, that kind of stuff? Or do you reckon we should just leave it op- pretty open? I uh, There is something about the idea of um, gathering a large amount of information over the course of play and then using that to affect a final outcome. Even mm-hmm. if that is to murder, um, one, some of the best bits of spy fiction that I think is quite neat is usually getting into the psychology of the mark or target that you need to yeah. do the spy shenanigans with. And sometimes that piece of info gathering can be quite fun to explore. Um, mystery writing, however, is hard. I think Chris <laughs> yeah. is our resident expert on that one. Oh, I love mystery writing. It's just hard. I love mysteries. I am terrible at writing mysteries for RPG games because, as Nathan says, it's really freaking hard. Mm-hmm. Really? really I, I think I think it's one of the most easy to do. Just go back and... Um, you know, you, you, you set your ending point and you try to reach this. Ah, uh, ah, uh, that's then not the, the issue. the keep going off piece yeah, and asking yeah. other questions you don't have answers for, but if you mm-hmm. give the wrong one, it ruins everything. Yeah, yeah. if you, um, the, the, the problem isn't making a convincing mystery for your own head, it's building it in a way where you can get the players to follow along regardless of what they do. Um, There is actually really, really good resources about that um, available on the internet. Um, Any of the Gumshoe games on the Gumshoe engine tend to give a fair number of words on how to build a mystery that makes sense. Um, City of Mist, which is a relatively recent indie darling with a hardback that is way too large, but spends mm, about a fifth of it explaining on how to write a mystery of varying depths cool. for like a mystery that goes across multiple sessions for example and things like that um so it's easier than it used to be there's definitely more resources available and ones that give you good hints on how to make you how to um let your players get the right kind of information no matter what they do yeah. i've um, used the advice in gumshoe quite heavily mm-hmm. yeah I, I really liked the uh I think it was Esoterrorist that had like some particularly good stuff for what I was doing at the time. So I just uh, ingested it and uh, just it's just really good to have to fall back on that the, mm-hmm. the advice. And uh, anyone that says illusionism is cheating, um, obviously is, you know, probably doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you know, anyway. part, of a, part of a process of collaborative storytelling is people wanting to be along for the ride. And I don't see anybody willing to take part in the mystery and be like, no, don't give me the solution to these difficult puzzles. <laughs> it just causes problems when like, you, somebody asks you something and it's like, I'm going to have to think about that. Or you think of something that seems to make sense, but then you realize screws over something else. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I had one and no one. there was this uh, great moment in a game I ran last weekend, actually, uh, where the players never looked at the record books in the uh, fish like market owner's office to see like how he'd been cooking the books and they definitely <laughs> would have got it so i had to try to introduce the clues in a different way and yep. it was uh, it was tricky Fun and time. they didn't quite get it it came off a bit frustrating basically but hey yeah. learning experiences um, I guess as a practical bit of takeaway, like on air, rather than just saying go and pay and read these books, is um, when I last ran a mystery, I printed every character bio and clue that was relevant to the case on index cards, and mm. we gave those to the players. So there is literally zero chance of somebody forgetting to write down an important clue because it is. <laughs> visibly an eyeline that they can kind of move around i even yeah um was very close to getting a very large cork board and some red string because i love the uh, imagery <laughs> of that but yeah. I, I did do it for that one instance but i'm sure there are mystery style games out there that would really benefit from having cue cards and some red string and let the players kind of weave it themselves quite literally i've seen unknown armies done with that yeah. mm. So, yeah, given we're, if we're sticking to the one GM, three players, that means... Another way around. <laughs> yes, that, that, that first way around would actually be coherent. Um, <laughs> yes, if we're doing multiple GMs and one player, well, mm-hmm. sorry, one, that does kind of imply a different character relationship than in normal games where obviously it's one piece, one player to one 
PC, mm-hmm. which so it, the easiest way to do that seems to be to have kind similar to like everybody is John or something where it's one character that everybody kind of gets to play at varying points or make do things. Hmm. I think that a nice setup piece for that is probably like deep cover enemy territory type thing. Yes. So there is nobody you can trust apart from in theory your handler. Hmm. Oh or handlers. Yeah, that is one thing I, I enjoy about the spy genre. Or at least I don't know, it probably shows up more in kind of like child at like child and teen age aimed spy stuff than adult things but the idea of like the oracle like the person like feeding you the info um i'm thinking like the black guy and kim possible like that that kind of info broker what if one spy had multiple info brokers and they are all generally trying to get the the spy to do a thing but they all each have kind of like sub or personal motivations and they're trying to feed the player just the right info to get them to do that kind of thing. Kind of like a hidden goals mm-hmm. thing. Would this be GM though? Like, would they be actual yeah. GMs or yeah. players? It's uh, it's it's essentially three GM PCs and then one player. Because I don't know if you had, I can see multiple GMs for things. If you had like a ton of players, multiple GMs is useful because it means that they can split the responsibility and kind Mm. of like you know focus in multiple areas when you're kind of looking after just one person what would suggest that the gms are actually doing if they're not twiddling their thumbs because it has to be fun for them as well is juggling large amounts of information so either that is like having a really large number of clues or a large number of npcs or they are playing their own game like separate to what the player is playing like an asynchronous game rather yeah. than it being yeah one thing that i would like to come back to that was brought up mm-hmm. is the um like note cards index cards mm. uh, mm-hmm. for me uh with the technology that personally says like trello or something like that where you can physically like that's not, not physically but you can lay them out like spatially a bit as well yeah I can see that. It's designed for like quick information overviews, and uh, you can link things, and I believe you can hide certain things as well from certain people. Okay. So certain people can't see links. That could be very interesting. Hmm. Hmm. Right. Um, would you guys like to quickly discuss splitting responsibility while I quickly go look up some of the specifics? Uh, well, well, by all means, by all means, absolutely. Uh... Okay. Do any? Do either of you have any kind of like off the cuff? So, um, so for splitting responsibility, so you've got uh, this is going to be very rambling. I thought. Um, so you've got multiple GM, well, or multiple info brokers. I guess we're going for rather than strictly GMs. Mm. So their in turn, their main influence, I, I'm thinking, is going to be, as the name suggests, more based around information rather than actual over mechanics so rather they if they want something done they presumably need to convince whoever's playing playing the spy to actually do it mm-hmm. now i see uh, that so the, um, i'm trying to think of kind of mechanical differentiation or something a different way to do it would be like i'm i'm going to cite james bond now but um uh, so james bond is a brit and mm-hmm. uh, most most of James Bond career, he was in the Cold War setting and all this sort of thing. So you have three, um, three varying um, um, entities. Uh, one was the Americans, the other was the Soviets, and the third one was the actual world, the, the things that were happening, perhaps or perhaps the criminal world. You can, I, I think uh, that we can split the GNs to to have not. Um, not the handler me- mechanic, or they can do both. Have a, a handler uh, NPC or a oracle NPC, and they can um, sort of dictate what, um, I- in a GM way, what the um, various power blocks do. Mm. So, mm. so for example, you have the 
again, you, uh, in in a bond set, you have the the American GM, which will um, you know uh, uh, do the American antagonists, would do the um, the influences uh, or the specific uh, moves or objectives that uh, this um, this side this um, uh, faction would have, or you have the Soviet one that you know dictates what happens when when the player um, goes into the different direction or thing like that. That's really interesting. So it's like a factional mm-hmm. split. Um, so like an area where this player has the authority is their faction, the thing their faction's doing. Yeah. With the American, say if, if, with your example, with the American like faction head or however we go um, do that piece of, particular piece of terminology. I'm not mm-hmm. quite sure. But anyway, um, so would the American player be able to say, yeah, the American government is posturing in this particular area and this is sort of the fallout from it? Um, what? How do the other factions react? Yeah, and I think um, as a GM, um, they could do more. They could just say that the American car um, chasing the... British player, for example, the American car, um, you know, uh, turns turns right, turns left. They they can do stuff uh, like adjudicate adjudicate specific parts of the game world. Mm-hmm. I think that does give them a role in other scenes as well. Mm-hmm. If you're playing out a scene with the spy and a, a Russian general, there could be things going on inside outside. You could be asked what america's role in this particular thing is yeah or you could you know um you you have a main game master in a specific scene and the other Mm. two can uh provide things like um i don't know the weather or some um some innocent bystander i mean additional voices definitely is going to be oh yeah godsend for any gm is to have some (laughs) additional npc voices for you oh totally totally (laughs) I, I I like the the idea of um, uh, I guess the GMs take turns I guess in the way that um, players would otherwise. But yeah, um, a quick suggestion or like a a phrase that we can like throw into this cauldron: everything a GM puts into the world, or should we say, everything an informant puts into the world is true. Yeah. So as the GM slash informants mm. take turns. And they provide the uh, spy with intel. That intel is never false. It forces, hmm. I guess, in a way, everyone to kind of yes, and the way this spy mission is going. Um, I'm like, wondering whether we. I'm going to quickly tr- check Trello again because I do mm-hmm. have an account now. Um, I'm going to have a quick check because it might be possible to have like two sides to a card. Mm. The one that one that the GMs see, which is always true, mm-hmm. and one that the player sees, which isn't all like right. well, it's the it's the impression given, it's the like actually what happened, not mm. the the why, not yeah. the uh, not the sort of setting behind it. I guess I just like the idea of um, all the informants again all doing the same mission. But it's like if you ask three different people to write the same to write a story with the same title and character names, and okay. they all have different ideas of how that story goes. But yeah. then, as one person tells the story and makes that part of it canon, everybody else now has to rewrite their story so it matches up and makes sense. Yeah, I'm Ooh. thinking some way of possibly rewarding and the... writes down what they think the true horror is behind the circumstance. But as you take turns and other people kind of add things in of what they think their story is because they've got that written down, everybody else needs to update their story with that information, even if it's just kind of working it round in a bizarre conspiracy theorist way to tie into their own stuff. And that yeah. kind of um, behind the scenes chaos probably makes it more fun as a GM to play. Yeah, I think we can learn a lot from Lovecraft esque in that. Rather than being a passive info giver, at least you are also doing something when it is not necessarily yeah. your turn. Mm-hmm. So here's a thing that I'm thinking. If I can work out how to do it, and uh, that's probably not going to be very, but uh, I'm going to put it out there. 
Mm -hmm. It'd be really nice to have two sets of info, one player facing, one um, GM facing. It would also be nice to let um, GMs basically flag when they think they've um, interacted with a piece of information. And then the other GM can sort of acknowledge that and they get points. Points. Effectively. Um, in the same way that everyone is John has uh, points, which you can then bid to um, take the next scene, effectively. Ah, okay. So it's not actually a victory condition at all. It's, I, wanna, I really want to take the next scene. I am going to mm. bet six. And the good thing about cards is that we can build the cards and then make them public, and then, um, you know, we've got a blind bid. Because there'll be edit history. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that could be quite interesting. It could be a bit complex, but uh, I don't know if, how how easily people are going to be able to interact with the technology. Are people going to spend too much time doing that and not, you know, doing the rest? Yeah, uh, I guess it's um, well, um, you know how, um, how let's say fiasco where yeah. when people kind of like. Uh, when it's somebody's narrative, for the people who've not played Fiasco before, it's a GMless game. Everybody plays their own character and visits in on each other's scenes. And if an additional NPC is required in a scene, you can sub in one of the other players whose turn it's not to be that person. But sometimes, um, at least in that game, because that game is like wild and funny a lot of the time, even if you're not doing something, it's still quite quite engaging. But if yeah. there's uh, secret maneuvers occurring, in in this game it kind of feels like there's an imperative thing for um other players who are who it's not their current narration or whatever are doing something mm. i i recently um was part of a dungeons and dragons battle royale thing where it's the players against each other there's like a special session okay. and uh two of the players had invisibility as a spell and uh, how that was rendered in game is that their figure was removed from the map, so the other players who don't have invisibility can't see them. And they texted what they were doing to the GM. Brilliant. No, it was awful. Because from the perspective of the people who weren't invisible, I just sat there while they texted each other back and forth ah. for a couple minutes at a time. And I'm like, I am so bored. I have to wait for my turn and the turns where it's not me are genuinely unexciting because nothing is going on from my perspective. <laughs> so then <laughs> it was fun for them. They had a they had a riot of a time. They were like, oh my God, that was so tense. Um, but unfortunately yeah. for everybody else, it ended up being a little dry. Um, what yeah. was the point of this scene? Like, was this combat? Yeah. Um, it was, for, for I guess, for full context, it was the DM's birthday. So instead of doing a regular session, they we made a, they made us fight each other for their own amusement, I guess. <laughs> uh, last person alive gets a special item for the rest of the campaign, which is high stakes for people who are not built for combat. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was an interesting time. I'm not quite sure if it worked. But the idea yeah. of doing secret things is cool. You just need to make sure that the people who are not doing secret things oh, yeah. can be entertained. Yeah, I mean, if it wasn't D and D, and it was like something where you could quite easily go, right? I'm going to do this, like one text, it's done, kind of mm. thing. Yeah, that might have been a bit better. Mm -hmm. But uh, in a game that's trying to be tactical in that way, it, you know, I can see why it didn't work for you. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's a good point about this this game. I guess the uh, the nature of the I, I quite like the the like uh, Soviets and the US as kind of like large powers in this. How serious that goes, I guess, remains to be seen. But is this like action spies or is this kind of like um, gritty, desaturated twelve part TV drama spies where there is a lot of like dialogue and atmosphere but not doing? I I think the latter. I, I Okay. I, mm -hmm. I want there to be a, a scene where the guy is like looking at his plumbing conspiracy board, you know, at, like on the evening with his with his whiskey and occasionally asking some questions about how people look. You know? Hmm. Okay. Crazy action tends to be more about certainty of what's going on as well. Like if you've yeah. got a crazy ass car chase. You normally have a good idea you need to get somewhere really, really fast. 
which mm-hmm. if you've got three different GMs all describing slightly different stuff is probably a lot rarer. Whereas in this, it sounds like, as Purple says, the PC is going to spend a lot of time not entirely sure what to do, because if they kick off an international accident, oops. But that's red, though. I, I don't know. My 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 yeah. realm of spies is very much in the uh, somewhere between James Bond Junior and the Austin Powers films uh, style of spy, <laughs> where um, you can the spy is competent but also causing a lot of like background havoc. But in the end of the day, they tend to get their man because the idea of them being given um, large amounts of potentially conflicting information but they still need to act in a very fast yeah. manner means that they will make rash, possibly poor decisions. And that sounds entertaining to me. Um, I, I can see the, I can definitely see the, the kind of like genuine immersive tension of it being a thinky thing. Mm. I mean, if we do the whole thing of it is set in the modern day, um, this guy literally has a blooming Trello board and is and like a Tor router, you know, on his phone. <laughs> And is literally putting the like connecting the dots. That could be actually quite interesting. I think that more action based, um, a more action based game would um, re- result into the game being more about skill resolution than anything else. And I think we want to um, we want to, to to have the spotlight on the different mechanics uh, from what we do. Otherwise, just a gimmick. Um, hmm. I think, anyway. Yeah, I see what you mean there. Like, we don't want it to be a side part of the game. We want it to definitely be the car. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. And it also means that we get to test doing this out, which I suppose is kind of the point of the podcast. Hmm. Hmm. But yeah, I think what you were saying earlier, Nathan, about there being the sort of setup phase and the like, action phase. Could also work. Yeah, I yeah, I I, I guess. Um, well, it depends on. I, I I guess in in this kind of with it being an asynchronous game, uh, players and their play styles are going to affiliate with one side of this than the yeah. other. I know that if I was an informant, um, what I would be writing down as my truths, sight unseen of what the other truths are from what's being set would probably still be quite action heavy like you yeah. know you need to go the, the 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 mark that you need to go and get the microfish from is on this cruise ship but this cruise ship has lots of heavily armed guards designed like yeah. dressed as elegant debutantes and that cannot be taken seriously ever i i don't know well you, if you could that would be very impressive with uh, with other gms that would be um astounding but you know <laughs> I think there's a difference between the characters taking it straight, though, and it being a, a strange situation. Mm. I mean, having the character play things completely, you know, completely as if this is normal, this is their life, Yes, would be uh, really interesting. I think it would give you some of that immersion. And if you pitched it right, you wouldn't necessarily have to completely break everything. Mm-hmm. As in, they take information from three people on the regs to do their missions. This well, they're in a like a massively complex situation. They have to get as much information as they can from all sides. Mm-hmm. And uh, one side they're actually working for, who only shows up at the very end in a debrief, mm. or possibly the briefing and the debriefing. Like the GMs nominate someone, probably the person whose faction's closest, to give like a pre-agreed brief. Okay. Possibly just put it as a card on the Trello board, and you, they read it out loud. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I I guess that then means that the the ending scene of this game, um, the faction that you debrief with is probably going to be up for grabs. I think so. Yeah, yeah. that's cool because I I like the Ooh. idea of you know we not even the player knows whether they're a double or a triple agent <laughs> until it happens. Yeah. At which oh, point. that'd be really good. Hmm. Yeah, so there may be a bit of a toss toss up uh, deciding which faction you start off with and that might be, you know, um each of the the GMs, the GM informants are kind of like, okay, so if you side with me at the start of this, I will give you this gadget. 
and then the player gets to pick who they like side with to begin mm. with and then that so so there's like you know it's putting it in the player's hands i think about yeah. who they'd like to start with but then how it ends up is entirely you know uh yeah. up for grabs i mean the problem there i think is that if you're spying in like an in a like a foreign country mm. then um if you're spying in russia taking russia as your um, handler is a bit of a weird option I guess it presupposes then that the place that they're in is in none of the um, factions is territories. It depends on what you're start because mm. you could be starting off as a known, slightly dodgy, possibly double agent type as well. So, mm-hmm. although Russia is briefing you, even Russia's kind of going, mm, "Can we really trust this guy?" Russia's well, a large country. Trust. There are terrible people yeah. in Russia that we need to kill sometimes. Also that, yes. <laughs> or we think this guy is planning to defect. Make sure he doesn't. Mm-hmm. So there's definitely reasons behind. Make sure you well find the agent who's trying to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or we think he's planning on defecting. Make sure he does so we can then legitimately kill him because at the moment he's oh, got him into a mole. or something. Yeah. Mm. Feed him false information. That kind of thing. I think there's gotta be a plan there, but letting the you don't want to necessarily let the player into it. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. You should probably let the other GMs in. Yeah, I agree with that. They they all collectively decide on what the brief is. So it's no secrets between GMs. Or like once something said or put on the board between GMs, it's on there. It's not going away. So what that's what I'm thinking. What do you guys think? Because they they are bathing in dramatic irony throughout the entire <laughs> process. Like <laughs> Yeah, this is a lot of this is going to come down to I don't know if regulating is quite the right word, but how the players, sorry, how the GMs bounce off each other and trying to keep that so at least it's known enough what they're trying to do, if that makes sense. Yeah. So they're not one of them isn't going completely somewhere over one way while the other two are doing something and trying to bind those into some some overall thread becomes impossible. It's going to be trying to keep things so they don't fully know what's going on, but they have enough in common to be coherent. Hmm. Are we thinking about some sort of like limited to basically limited actions type thing in the same way as well theoretically like Dungeon World, the uh, GM moves more concretely, microscope, um like card playing. You know, when you yeah. actually physically write the card. I'm not sure how much needs to be mechanical rigor and how yeah. much needs to be the kind of session zero type of stuff of... I think that's going to be is... yeah, definitely one to explore. For me, this feels like one where we're going to give it a go on the first arc. <laughs> sorry, the first uh, like episode of the playtest, and then we're going to probably change things quite a bit between. That's how Fair this enough. is feeling to me. Because uh, with cards, I've got an idea of how that works. With this, I'm really stepping into the dark. <laughs> yeah. Well, we could, um, yeah, we could uh, try to think if there's a um, uh, sort of tech way um, to do some some changes into this, or you know, include some things perhaps. Um, I'm trying to think if there's some form of. Uh, general uh way of per- perhaps there could be a clock like chess uh that uh you know gms have specific time to make their moves for example mm. Or, mm. but i'm not sure mm. that would, would do well to keep things a little bit kind of frenetic so you can't plan too much mm. uh, ba- basically like the, the Way the chess clocks work, you have you have a specific amount of time, and you can you can flip the um, you can flip the clock whenever you want, and you know that you have if you spend more time on one action, you have less time uh, for for the other ones. But you can spread it out a bit and make sure that there's um, this sort of thing instead of. Instead of actual time, we could say there's um, there's a number of pips uh, that every uh, GM has, and they can spend more pips 
in a specific scene, but that means they have less pips for for the next one or something like in 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 that area. We could with tech, we can do a lot of things like this. Mm. But there was that previous mention of uh, everyone is John and uh, bidding to do things. Um, that does that does seem to kind of work for this. If, for example, um, all GMs start with I don't know twenty info points. Let's give it an abstract name, and you can bid info points to give some information to your spy. Um, but those don't regenerate, and essentially the game is forced into its conclusion phase once all info points across all players are spent. Um, so there is a uh, you you then as a um as a as a informant are given that choice between forcing plot points you really want to include uh against having lots of opportunities to drop lots of plot points across the session but in the end you still end up having a fixed amount and there is a point where everybody realizes that there is a final phase that is entered and yeah. is approaching because that also as you get nearer and have fewer resources to give information to the spy that sounds like desperate even on paper <laughs> yeah that sounds really good i really like that idea also it does help pace the game it means that short games are gonna be a lot of like high power plays mm -hmm. and uh like quite tense in that respect um, yeah you get to and... essentially control the length of the game by giving a specific number of plot points and possibly a maximum bet. I don't know. I'd probably take the same number. No, I mean, like, say if you wanted to run a short session or a shorter session, then by default, the GMs would have like a smaller pool to start with. Or if you want to do an all day spy marathon and then they have like 50 points to go and spend so you can, like, you know, uh, customize how, how long and how desperate you'd want the game to be. Personally, I think that having twenty just all the time would work mm, because mm. in a in a short game, people are going to make very rap, like high power like moves and hope that people are going to not follow it up with huge bids, that kind of thing. Sure, okay. And in a small, in a longer form game, people are probably just going to bet less. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is definitely how it tends to work with everyone is John. Sure. So, um, I don't know if we need to adjust it. Mm. I mean, unfortunately, that's a very hard one to to one eyeball and two for us to test. Oh God, I'm bad at math. I have no idea whether that would be good maths or not. <laughs> this is this is why we have the second session to to do changes in between as well. So it's going to be fine. Yeah, if we're f finding we're having trouble getting rid of twenty in in two hours, then mm -hmm. I'm sure we can adjust. Great. So, is there anything else people want to touch before we go on to the next uh, part? The next part is primarily going to be the uh, specifics of the game, the mm. actual mechanics themselves. Does that makes sense. Sure. Uh, there is an idea that I that popped into my head, and I love, but is inappropriate for this game. But I just want to kind of throw it out into the ether. Um, the idea of using technology for this game is really cool. I really like that. Um, the I, if this was a a, a campier, gadgetier game, the idea that the um, and you're playing this over computer, so you're not playing face to face. That any of the players could take a photo of something that they have in meat space and say that this is now a gadget that is available in the scenario. Like you come across a locked door. And you don't have your standard lock picks on you because this is a modern era. Nobody has like thief lock picks on you. But and then you rummage around in your room and I've got this USB drive, but actually it's not. It flips open into an advanced the the idea of kind of using random tools from your own desk space to do things within the fiction. Mm. That kind of like uh crossing of the two worlds is an idea that I thought was really neat, but is entirely inappropriate for this. Why do you think do you think it's inappropriate? I the 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 tone that's kind of been established so far is um quite quite grounded, which is fine. That's that's cool. But the idea largely of like um spy gadgets that look mundane but do something silly is very much pulpy spy work, which is red. I love pulpy spy work, but the theme that we've kind of been building so far is maybe not the one. 
Okay, so in, in terms of tone rather than um, than mechanics, yeah, applicability. Okay, okay, yeah. let's see. Well, we could we could like paranoia does this. It has a serious mode which is really dark and gloomy, and has a zap mode which is more colorful and careless. We could have variations in this. It could be a bonus rule if you want to camp it up a little bit. I think sure, sure. Um, the, the, there's always this option. I had an idea about a specific mechanic since we um, we include technology, and this is that the game is again played via Skype or some uh, or Discord, for example, um, mm. and people use voice changes between the um, the microphones and the player. So Heck yeah, the, okay. oh, so man. so listen to me. So the player doesn't know which GM is playing which <laughs> faction. Uh, <laughs> so it's literally just yeah, anonymous voices on the line. Yeah, and That's you know, s- sometimes you might guess from from the words people use, but sometimes this could be very, very um, you know, uh, changing. And if if the game masters change over over uh, over the sessions there's a good chance that nobody has any idea what what's happening so that is delightful for theming and if i end up as the gm and not the spy in this i am absolutely going to use a voice changer throughout the entire thing no matter what we end up doing oh brilliant. i'm sorry that you've sealed this fate but <laughs> Yeah, I I think uh, also like using photos and stuff is like a really nice idea. It uh, mm. doesn't work quite as well for radio. No, it absolutely does not. Well, I don't know. There's something along the uh, 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 the the idea of somebody taking something ridiculous. It sows through into Discord. Everybody in Discord reacts audibly to what that is and explains what the photo is. But yes, yeah. uh, there is definitely an additional layer that makes it radio friendly it's not radio friendly inherent i agree yeah um it, it would be cool to do uh the other thing i think that we should probably keep in mind is that ideally this would be playable solely over the trello board and I, mm. I, i'm not saying that's a thing we have to do i'm saying i'd like us to consider it a goal well i you mean trello board plus voice chat otherwise it's no untenable. no um possibly entirely on the trello board oh i dislike that yeah, me too. I, I think that we could use multiple tools instead of one. Yeah, fair enough. Trello lets you attach files, doesn't it? So if nothing else, can you attach an audio recording? I mean, yeah, but that is so much. I, I can see if this was in an alternate universe where we're doing this, like play by po- this that that yeah. then moves it into like play by post territory, which is a valid way to play a tabletop RPG. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, um, but. I don't know. The idea of having Trello as a resource board, and that's where the information is canonized, I think is really cool, and yeah. um, down for exploring that. But also, you know, part of the being the cool informant character is being able to be a literal voice mm. in the spy's ear, and not having audio removes that angle that I think is part of the immersive experience. Yeah, I, I mean, I didn't mean that we should actually do that. I, I, <laughs> I entirely meant that if the we... build of it for real reels turns yeah. it yeah into... right okay i would still say then i would still want to do voice oh totally voice work for that but now i see what you mean now yeah so the i think yeah you've made some very good points both of you that there's got to be like a second channel for the role play aspect of it mm. yeah um, like descriptions and things it, it would take hours to just write it, it won't be real time uh yeah. so would it still be a session? Like it, it changes lots of our um, understanding of what a tabletop role playing game is. Yeah, I think though you you know a combination between say like a Skype or Discord or like a, even a text chat and the Trello board would um, you know, probably still work. From what you're saying, you still get to play the character. Obviously, let's say when we're, we're not going to do that, we're going to record it, but. Um... I still think it's worth bearing in mind that having more ways to play this game would be nice. Sure. And I think it's going to make us make better mechanics. Hmm. 
how how do you play a character? How, let's let's go to the player character. How does the player character do things in a non-voice uh, situation? You think? I mean, have you done any play by post role play? I have. Um, the, 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 my main concern is so lots of times the the play by post thing is mm-hmm. uh, so there's a single there's a single thread that combines um, that combines every peop, every person's actions. My yeah. question is in Trello you have multiple threads, so this this is a way to um, this is a way to to include this mechanic. So you think there's a thread that the player describes their actions, basically. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. But uh, again, it's it's more something to bear in mind rather than something that is one of our core design principles, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I guess, you know, people do play by post D&D, even though within rules as written there is nothing necessarily uh there to make it accordant for player by post it's just functional in that system mm. chris do you know wayne yeah it well do, going play by post does very much change the tone and style of a game because you have a lot more time to think about what you're going to do mm-hmm. and you're writing it down rather than Kind of the more quick fire, bouncing ideas off each other, going, "Oh, I'm going to do this," even though you may realise that's a bad thing or strange idea, or whatever. Shortly afterwards, whereas yeah, play by post tends to be a lot more kind of literature is entirely the correct term, but it tends to be a lot more thought through and a lot more deliberate. Mm. The base mechanics we're using, you could probably adapt without. Well, you can probably adapt the base ideas, but it's going to end up being the fact that you can think it through rather than having to kind of quickly bounce these ideas around and work out what how somebody else's stuff fits into your conspiracy mm-hmm. means that you'd probably end up with something that's a lot more coherent overall, but it probably wouldn't be as as engaging almost. Dynamic, yeah. Yeah, I've never done play by post myself, so that might just be my preconceptions of it. Yeah, I find it uh, quite difficult generally, partly because I've got a really bad attention span for these things. So I'll write like a load of things, and then I'll get like a pretty generic response, and I'll just be like, "Well, not bothering there again." Then <laughs> <laughs> it's um, it's one of those really weird things. I I also. Like I will be genuinely having some fun with it, then I will just completely forget. I won't be in the mood to write anything that evening, and then I will completely forget about the whole experience and just oh, be reminded of it like a month later. Mm-hmm. For purposes of this, yeah, you'd probably, I don't know, possibly want some kind of word limitation or something. Try Ooh. and keep things fairly terse rather than somebody writing several you know hundred or thousands of words mm-hmm. yeah. it's, and well the general way we seem to be going with the live version of the game is that it should be relatively fast fairly brief mm-hmm. yeah we mm, to keep things moving keep everyone kind of guessing a bit as to what's going on whereas if you suddenly have here's a novella to read Firstly, there's a lot more information that's going to slip out because yeah. you have all of this additional text. And actually, if you do have that amount of text, you might end up with kind of internal monologue or thoughts or plot from the characters that just would never arise in a shorter hit. You see a you see a dead body of the Russian ambassador sort of thing where there's just no space for all that extra information. Yeah. That's quite interesting. I think, yeah, often things get over can get over explained if people have time. Are we looking at sort of short scenes then? Um, are we looking at like about a few minutes each? None of the big, long, drawn out conversations. We just montage that stuff, you know? Hmm. That's a good. I mean, uh, 
so Shadowrun Anarchy is largely done in narrations where you move from person to person and they kind of have a larger amount of control about what the scene is and where and what they're doing. Yeah. And then you get a feel for how long that takes. A narration, at least in a because it's a dice resolution system, um, lasts as long as it takes for you to decide on what you're rolling for and then the aftermath of that roll and then you move on. So there's yeah. something that kind of keeps a hard limit on how long the bit runs. Um, with something like Fiasco, you just go until you kind mm. of get a feeling mm. of how the scene is supposed to turn out, yeah. which is cool. You know, uh, people who can kind of both uh, have improv dialogue, but still kind of keep it to a time limit is possibly a narrow subset of people. But red when you have them. Um, <laughs> So you know, uh, I, I guess it, that I guess that's a thing to discuss. I know that we wanted to kind of have this as a system that doesn't have um, resolution mechanics like dice or cards, but yeah. is something like fiascos um, people decide on a positive negative outcome? Uh, yeah. Is that a good thing to kind of include? If only so, we know when there is a stopping point in what we're doing in the scene. I think there should be. Um, yes. Microscope has a good one uh, because each scene asks a question and when the answer to that question comes up, the person who initiated the scene writes it down and the scene is over. Okay. Like, that, sounds, that sounds good. And that is um, the resolution can then be added to this Trello board, so that makes sense as a mechanic. Yeah. I think we, we could just wholesale, wholesale steal that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh god, steal every mechanic that's good. Like, why yeah. wouldn't you? <laughs> yep. So cool. I think that's um, a lot of ideas that we can like pound into a vaguely game shaped lump uh, over the next hour. So uh, <laughs> join us for that. Um, bye. Bye bye. 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 Wow. What the heck was that? That did? was me. I had. I have no idea. Fair enough. See you later. Me. Peace. Peace.